Hey you, you're listening to the Intentional Documentary Podcast. So glad to have you. Around here, I'm gushing over the stories behind the pictures that we freaking love of our own lives. You know, the ones we hold as high value and iconic, because this is where photography meets real life. I'm your host, Marie Moss, and I believe that the best way to approach your photography is through your lens, your way. Through insightful conversations with photographers, I'll explore preserving life with your camera and using what lights you up to grow your brand. Let's get started. Listen, this episode is absolutely packed. I interviewed Nick MacArthur, which if you've never heard of him, um, the first thing that we're going to do is give you an actual introduction. But I have to tell you that I recorded this episode a few months ago and just re-listened to it today, sitting out on my front porch, jotting down the notes for my show notes and all the things. And I couldn't stop listening to it. Like I was really that engaged the whole time because he is such a wealth of, not just a wealth of information. I mean, that sounds really dull and boring, but his perspective and his energy is just so fun. And I hope that you enjoy this as much as I did. So here's a little sneak peek in what you're going to hear. The first thing is we talk about his website because I had never even heard of the man. I wasn't shopping for anything. And I kid you not, I landed on his site and within a day, I think I bought a session with him, not a photography session. So I'll let your mind guess on what I may have invested in. And then we talk about selling pictures versus selling you. And then we talk about his marketing style or what I was noticing, lack thereof. I was stalking his Facebook and his Instagram, doing my homework for the podcast. And I'm like, man, it doesn't even seem like the man is really trying to gain any business on these outlets. How is he getting traffic to his website? So we talk about that and what he calls the slow burn. And then there's lots of and thens, isn't there? I told you, this is packed. And then we get into a conversation on super generalized gender roles in sales, which Nick has a really cool perspective here because he used to be female. So he has witnessed and experienced so much from both sides of the coin. So he he tells us quite a bit about that, which I found in my own experience as a female to be so on point in so many ways. Anyway, and then we talk about him and his wife and their five kiddos and how they are managing their own family memories. And then lastly, he shows us one of his iconic images of his client work. So I'm going to stop talking and get this episode rolling. All right, friends, I am back and I have a really, really awesome guest that I'm super excited for. His name is Nick MacArthur. And I did not know who he was not too long ago until I was looking at the speaker page for the Real Life Conference and I saw his name and that he's doing a talk on how to talk like a girl and get what you want. My interest was piqued. I went to his site, not looking at all for any kind of coaching strategy, branding advice, anything at all. And the next thing I know, I was booking with him because it just blew me away looking at his entire site. So Nick is here with me. Hi, Nick. Hey, how's it going? Good, thank well, you. I, I know you're good. I don't know why I asked. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we're going to do is just talk to you guys about, I have like a whole potluck of different questions to ask Nick that I think you guys are going to love. And before I get into the questions, Nick, can you just tell everybody, I mean, I know who you are, but can you tell everybody who you are, what you're about, how you help people and all the things? Yeah. Uh, my name is Nick. I live up in Canada in Calgary. Um, what I am about is I think I could be like, well, I'm a sales coach and an awesomeness expert. That's my title. Um, but truly I am about helping people realize how great they are and helping them um, be brave enough to use the things that make them different as a selling feature versus as a weakness. Mm. I yeah. like how you word that. You wear a lot of hats and you speak and like you do so many different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm also an activist for the LGBTQ community. Uh, yeah. I am a trans man. I write a blog about that. Uh, I am an ex photographer, I guess. I, maybe it's not so much X as it is that I just 
it's not what I am doing currently. I still work with past clients and stuff like that. I will never turn money away is the secret. Yeah. Um, or very rarely, I suppose. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I still really love, um, I still really love to like get behind the camera sometimes and make art. I just, what lights me up even more than that is seeing other people be able to do whatever it is that their passion is. Um, yeah. And actually do it for a living instead of being a starving mm-hmm. artist. So whether that's writing, like I work a lot with a lot of writers, a lot of, I randomly, I work with a lot of real estate agents. I don't know. Oh, you know, interesting. Like, I didn't know that. That's like an exciting new thing that like realtors keep contacting me. Uh, but I work primarily with like writers, um, photographers, artists, life coaches. Yeah. We can so, borrow yeah. that old saying, like you can take the photographer out of the industry, but you can't take the photographer out of the person. Photographer. Like, like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. Yeah. I mean, it all comes back to like, visually, I, I like capturing things. And I think even as a photographer, it wasn't about, for me, it was never about like, can I take a pre like, can I create a pretty image? I never mm-hmm. did the like staging and styled shoots and stuff. My like happy place is taking whatever the imperfection is um, with a family or a house or a mm-hmm. whatever it is that you're photographing, just taking the scene and being like, what's the most beautiful version of this that I can show these people? Yeah. Because I think often people can't see their own beauty and their own like connection in their own spark in their eyes. But if you look for it, it's there in everyone. So it's, let's, how do you take the mundane crappy parks and show them how really special and beautiful they are? So it was never about like, for me, creating the perfect image. I'm no Sue Bryce. I'm, it's, that's, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, show me your mess and let me find the, the like special part about it and show it back to you. It's so interesting that you framed that part of the photographer in you the way that you just did, because that's exactly what you're saying that, how you show up for people with your it factors just in a different way. So it's clearly a big part of you. Yeah. It's my wife. She hates me for it. She always is like, damn you. And always seeing the good side in people Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> because she'll be like ranting about something and, or someone has like done her wrong. And I'll be like, yeah, but just look at it from their perspective. I mean, they probably had a hard day and you don't know what mm-hmm. happened in their childhood. Mm-hmm. And like, I'm like, I'm always the like, look at the other, sh- the other side, put someone else's shoes on. And she's like, could I just rant for a minute? Just one time, please. I'm like, sorry. But I am that person who's like, show me your messy bits and I'll show you how they're beautiful. And whether that's within your business or in photography in or in your house yeah. or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So, and that's, I think that's really what spoke to me. So literally you guys, what happened was, I, like I said, I was on the real life conference page one minute and then I was on Nick's website and I was pretty much mind blown. I closed out the tab actually, and I couldn't get Nick out of my mind. I'm like, I need an it factor. What is my it? And I came back to book something that I wasn't even looking for. So Nick, how did you do that? (laughs) Uh, So I think it comes back to like who... On my website, I'm really upfront about like who I am and my my quirks I and my like things that could be a little bit too much for people. Instead of worrying that I'm too much for people, I'm like, I'm going to exploit the crap out of it. Yeah. So totally. instead of all your weird things, all of your like, this, these are the things that make me less desirable. So if I'm a family photographer by trade originally. Um, I am never going to compete with like the people who are really like, I just love cutesy kids and I just want to make your daughter into a princess or a fairy. And like, I'm not, I'm never going to show up with an expensive handbag and I'm never like, that's not who I am. I like my logo is never going to be a sock monkey. Like I am not sweet and whatever. So when I did family photography, it was like, Hey, I love to like, throw a backyard barbecue and drink beer with my friends and listen to music and like pretend like we're watching our kids. Do you like that too? Chances are we're the right people. I showed that I had tattoos. I swore on my family photography website Mm -hmm. because I felt like, okay, I have a family. I would like them photographed. I'm this person. Chances are 
and my friends are these people. Chances are that there are other people out there who also have families who have traded in their like concerts at on Thursday nights at dive bars for like backyard barbecues with beers and jumping castles or bouncing castles. You know what I mean? Like they too have had to grow up and train in all the fun stuff for the less fun stuff, but they're making it fun in their own way. And so if I can, can look, that's who I want to be instead of trying to compete with all the people with their coach handbags and their high heels and their whatever, I'm going to compete on like, I do it differently. I'm not those people. Mm -hmm. I am not, I'm not going to make the most beautiful image for you. I'm not going to Photoshop all your wrinkles out. I'm not going to make you look skinnier. I'm going to take a great flattering photo of you, but I'm not going to do those things and it's not going to be posed and the the light might not be exactly perfect. It might be a little more dramatic than you wanted or whatever, but like that's who I'm going to be. And the same thing goes with business coaching is that instead of, you know, pretending like I have all these qualifications and all these things. It's like, no, I follow my gut and it works for me. And most about pages are terrible. Don't be terrible anymore. Let me like, instead of, instead of sugarcoating it, I just, I exploit the things of who you are. Yeah. That makes total sense because I felt like when I was on your page, like I, I wasn't just reading about another business. I was really reading about you. And I think Mm -hmm. that that is missing a lot. I think that was like one of my questions that I was going to ask you, like, what are photographers missing? And I think that is one of the pieces right there is they are so focused on selling the pictures that they're not, I think they miss the mark on selling themselves along with what they're doing. Yeah. So I would totally agree. Two things. One of them is that the number one thing I hear from 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 photographers are my, in my market, it's more saturated than any other market. <laughs> yeah. So I need to know how to stand out, but they want to know how to stand out by fitting in. They don't want to yeah. stand out by being different. Mm-hmm. They really, they're like, the answer is still like, well, when I was 10, I got my camera from my grandfather and then we worked in the, in the dark room. And then I, whatever, I was born with the camera. I came out of the womb with me. I've always mm-hmm. been taking photos. People say that I know how to capture whatever. It's always, it's like, how do I stand out? But they're in, they're, they insist upon saying the same shit. Yeah. Because guess what? 98% of photographers fall into one of two categories. They either grew up shooting and they have loved it since childhood, or they had kids, they wanted to take better photos of their kids. Turns out they're really fucking good at it. Yeah. And then their friends started asking them to do it and they made a business out of it. I would say most photographers fall into one of those two categories. So if that's your story, if that's all you're going to share in your story, you're not any fucking different than anyone. Someone's gone to 10 photographers websites and has seen 10 different versions of the same story. Yep. Guess what? The average client doesn't know the difference between a good photograph and a great photograph. Mm -hmm. They know the difference between a great photograph and a shitty photograph, but they don't, they don't have the discerning eye to be like, Oh, the leading lines in that image were just not right. And the lighting was, if this photographer had stood two thirds to the left and like known the way that the light drops off, like, you know what I mean? Like they don't know those things. And so you're not actually competing on your images. People mm-hmm. think that like, oh, if I just take better photos, mm-hmm. I'll sell more. It's not true. It's an unfortunate truth that you can be a mediocre photographer and a great business person or have a really great personality that you're willing to put out there and do 10 times better than the amazing photographer with who's shy and isn't putting themselves out there and isn't a great business person. It's yeah. just the, the truth. And it sucks, yeah. but it's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the buying decisions I think boils down to, do I think I'm going to like working with this person? And if you're not showing you, then how can they measure? It's true. And there'll be, I've worked with clients who have said, but I'm not as interesting as you. And I say bullshit because (laughs) the truth is, is that you might not be as interesting to me specifically, but to your client that is your ideal client that you then that people are like, well, my ideal client is a hockey player who makes three million dollars a year. How do I get those? Well, no, that's not your ideal client. Yeah. Who like your ideal client is a personality type. Mm-hmm. And then you find that personality type. And guess what? That personality type 
it's not like, well, shy people don't make money, so they yeah. can't afford photos. Or like introverts don't make money, so they can't afford photos. Or loud, uh, exciting people don't make money. Like each archetype of person cre- has an income. It doesn't like rich people are not only a certain type of person. So exactly. you need to find the type of person that you fit with. Okay. Yeah. I click with this personality type, this, this, my favorite client, it's not about what they make, but it's like, okay, where do they, what, what lights them up inside? What, where do they hang out? Where, and I don't say that so that then you can then go put posters up at the coffee shop that they go to. That's not how it works, but Mm -hmm. like finding the like actual archetype of that type of person and then speaking to that person through your website. Mm-hmm. usually typically the type of person that you are best suited to work with matches your own personality traits. So if you share a lot of yourself, it's really easy for them to click with that and go, Oh, finally I found a photographer that feels like me that I could be friends with. Yeah. That makes so much sense. And speaking of websites, when I was looking at your Instagram and your Facebook it doesn't seem like you are doing a ton of like active marketing. It doesn't seem like like you're sharing a lot of pictures and you're showing up and you're being present, but you're not necessarily educating people and you're not all like in your face like a lot of marketers are. What would yeah. you like what are you doing to get people to your website and in why how does that work for you? I'm wondering. So I personally sell best one-on-one. There's lots okay. of people who the way that they sell best is creating a big newsletter and writing a blog post regularly. Like if you look at someone like Tara Whitney, Tara Whitney sells most of her stuff by being a great blogger. Yeah. That's just, she knows how to like keep you captivated and want to hear about her life and her family and what she Mm -hmm. sees and how she sees it. But that's just part, like that doesn't come because that's like, that's not a knowing Tara personally that's mm-hmm. not like a a scheme on her part she's not like she's not paying someone to blog good content she's just blogging from her heart and mm-hmm. being vulnerable and, and consistent and consistent um and some people do well by entering awards and getting recognized for their great work and just by the quality of work that they're putting out there. But they also have a kind of a quirky personality and they're open with that too. Like looking at Dana Pugh, she, she does well because she's shoots really consistently. She's a great photographer every time Mm -hmm. you can instantly tell it's her work right away. Mm -hmm. And she puts herself out there. She's not afraid to put herself out there for awards and like, put herself out there to teach and put herself out there in a vulnerable way, like just on Instagram lives and Facebook lives and stuff like that. But she's also not selling via newsletter, whatever. Yeah. And then, then you look at someone like, uh, Tamara Lackey and she sells by being really active in her community and the mm-hmm. things that she believes in right so she is outside of photography Mm -hmm. outside of photography she is active in the community of like marathons and running and she's active in the adoption community and she is active in the vegan community and she is active in small businesses because these are the things that she really cares about and then the photography sort of flows out of that does that make sense? And yeah, that me, makes total sense. Yeah, for me, I create relationships on Instagram mm-hmm. or Facebook mm-hmm. or wherever just by sharing who I am and what I'm about. Mm-hmm. And I become friends with someone and then eventually that person hires me. And it's always like a slow burn. My clients are never like, I found you or they're not often. There's like 20% of them are like, I came across your website. I knew I had to have you. They're like, mm-hmm. I've been following you for three months. I love everything you have to say. I think I'm ready to like pull the trigger now. And you're like, great. Or they're like, I've been following you for three and a half years since you were a photographer. I've watched you get divorced and get married and become a man. And I really would like to whatever. And you're like, wow, I'm glad that this thing that you heard me on three and a half years ago transitioned into like now a client. But 
some people get really frustrated that like I put a I put a ad out and no one bought right away. Okay, well maybe you're a slow burn, and maybe the like I'm going to send a newsletter out is not how you sell best. I、mm-hmm. sell almost nothing from a newsletter. I collect、mm-hmm. people's email stuff because that's a smart thing to do. And occasionally, I let people know when I'm taking photos again, or if I have an opening, or whatever. But typically, it's more like, "Hey, here's some. Let me teach you about how to write a better about page. Show it to me. Here's some feedback.、Mm-hmm. Then we build a relationship over six months, and like a year later, you hire me. Yeah,、and、that's that, okay with me. Yeah, that's what I noticed about you because I noticed that you showed up for. Um, I think you. One of the videos I saw, you were inviting people to check out Ballsy, the、mm. program that you had recently released with Kristen Kelp. I think her name was. Yeah. And so it, it seems like you. I guess like the way that you worded it, like you're a slow burn, but you're you're sh- you're consistent with just being present, even though you're not selling or necessarily sh- jumping on a Facebook Live and educating once a week or anything like that. But、yeah. you show up when it's important, and because、yeah. of your consistency, people respond. And because I'm not always selling something, it often、yeah. makes it. Ah,、uh, like when I do sell something, it's they're not so overloaded with my bullshit. Like、mm-hmm. it's often it's like well if I just I'm always selling something someone will eventually buy it. My thing is like if I don't sell anything very often if I'm just being myself、mm-hmm. and then when I do have something for sale people are like oh he's selling something he doesn't do this often I should pay attention、yes. versus like blocking out the the clutter you know yeah because what I notice photographers do and I, I talk to my own community about this all the time I'm all about planting these story seeds like pieces of connection. That I think do the same thing as what you're doing, just showing a piece of your life, and because people then see you as more than just someone with a camera, and then you promote to them, and they pay attention because you're not selling all the time. But what I see photographers doing, they just share a client photo or a personal photo, and they just share a picture, share a picture, share a picture, and then all of a sudden it's like now booking for the fall season, and they're I think the ones that don't get any traction with that.、Um, I think that a lot of that is is because they're they're not showing up. They're not showing that much of their life. It's very flat. They're like they're trying to let just the images speak. Do you think that that could be part of it? I do. I think that it's great that the images are there. But if you're not telling a story with the image, you're going to have a harder time. Yeah, because people、I、can't mean, they they can look at the image and love it, but I think they can't translate that. Like they're not. I don't want to say smart enough, but they're not smart enough to translate what how that picture applies to their life necessarily.、Exactly. How they could get that for their life, and they're not supposed to be smart enough because they're not photographers,、yeah. and that's not their family. But、mm-hmm. I mean, if I look at okay, like it doesn't even if I'm thinking like maybe not everyone's a storyteller, right? I、yeah. am like, here's my picture. Let me tell you a story about it because it doesn't actually like just a nice picture doesn't mean anything. To that person because it's not their family. They don't、mm-hmm. think, "Oh, I'd like that." If you tell the story about why this photo matters, about what it means to that family, then it's more likely to be like, "Oh, you know what? I would have a, the thing that matters to me that I would like captured is this moment in our family." Yes.、Um, but if you're not the person who's a storyteller, look at someone like Gabe McClintock. So that、mm-hmm. guy kills it. He is a ridiculous photographer.、Mm-hmm. He like. Best of the best, whatever, right? But he doesn't tell a story when he when he shows a photo. But he doesn't just show a photo either. He finds a piece of poetry that expresses,、mm-hmm. or a quote that expresses like the feeling that that image has, and、yeah. it sticks in your mind. But there's this like, yes, that's a beautiful photo, and it's saying like. I don't know. Your breath is my breath. I don't. I don't、yeah. know. This, but like, <laughs>、yeah. there's some like beautiful piece of poetry that you're like, oh, that's not just a beautiful photo, but that's a romantic moment between those people. Yeah. He's not a writer. He just has to find a really pretty poem. Like. Yeah. That makes just, sense. I mean, maybe Gabe. I don't know Gabe personally, so maybe he is a poet and he fucking loves poetry, and so he's got a whole like list of poetry he loves, and he takes a photo and thinks of the poem at the time. But maybe he's just googling a beautiful poem. Like、right. I don't know, you know what、yeah. I mean? And he's like, "Yeah, that matches that."、Mm-hmm. It doesn't. People are addicted to stories.、Mm-hmm. So tell a story with your stuff. Yeah, 
another photographer just talking about the poetry, I think, and I don't know if she still does this, but I'm pretty sure it's Heidi of Velvet Owl Photography. She shares lyrics to songs. Yeah, see? Similar to him. Mm -hmm. Right. Similar concept, right? It's that like, what does that mean to you? And then I'm sure that her people, clearly if she's showing lyrics to songs, then it means that she is someone who really connects with people who will love music. Mm -hmm. So her people, chances are, are are looking at it and going, you know what? My art, like mine and my spouse's or me and my kid's song is this. I would love a photo that captured that lyric of our favorite song. Like it gets people's heads turning. I remember Mm -hmm. like mine's thinking um, and in a way that matches her, right? Like she's, she's clearly a music fan. She's going to attract other music fans. It's a natural thing. It's not some force like, well, I have to say something. So I should just, I guess I saw this other person sharing a poem. So I'll share a poem. Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't matter to you, if you can't, that's not part of who you are. It won't resonate anyway. Yeah. 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 Are you guys listening to this? This is such good stuff. Um, <laughs> so Nick, before I want to ask you a few questions about your yeah. factors in a minute, but I have one more question because we, this is during my it factor. We started talking about mm-hmm. this and you were pointing out how, especially there's say some men in the fitness world who can show up on Instagram stories and be like, buy this cause I'm awesome. And then us girls over here are all about the stories and educating and putting so much energy into the sales. Why does it seem so hard for us? What's, um, what's a happy medium? What is something that we can take away from? I don't know, being in the middle of, buy my stuff and let me hold your hand. Yeah. It's so having the lucky privilege of having (laughs) lived as a woman and now living as a man, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of things. It like really, it like lit a fire under my feminist as fuck ass was what it it did is like, Oh, okay. I knew that women got treated different, but like when I moved to being seen, I mean, I don't ever get misgendered now. I'm always gendered male. Mm -hmm. Um, and so seeing the difference in the way that people treat me now that I'm a man versus the way that they treated me when I was a woman mm-hmm. is, is shocking. And it, it took a lot for me to like, I was just full of a lot of anger for a long time about it. And so now it's like, uh, like ask me about my feminist agenda anytime. And I've got one. Um, <laughs> Cause I have a wife and I have daughters and people I love. And I just, I feel like this is bullshit. And most of my clients are women. Mm-hmm. Um, And the truth is, is that women are expected to back up everything that they say and to prove everything they say with facts. That's Mm -hmm. just the truth. And men are seen that whatever they say is fact. And that is a social, it's like just culturally what happens, especially specifically here in North America. That's Mm -hmm. just the way it is. And do I wish it were different? Yes. Do we need to change that? Yes. But it, it is just the way that it is as well. So expect that that's just the way that it is that you have as women, Mm -hmm. you, you have no choice, but to sort of back your shit up and to do a little more educating and handholding. Yeah. That Um, makes sense. Why these book now Facebook ads don't really work for us. It doesn't work for women. It just doesn't. Um, what you can do, though, that would help is that women also do this thing where they're like, they, it says book now, but what it really says is book now. If you want to, mm-hmm. I, would re- I really would like it. I'm really good, I promise. It says mm-hmm. that instead of, hey, here I am. Book your session now. I'm amazing. Let me tell you how. Okay. Let me tell you why. Okay. Do you, can you hear the difference oh, in the yeah. way that those are, it, women still have to say, let me tell you how, let me tell you why, but they need to say it matter of fact, not like, here, I promise I'll show you. Look, do you need a discount so you can feel like I show you? Okay. Um, let me do it for free first and then you'll see how great it is. And then you'll just pay me out of the goodness of your heart. That's how women do it. Okay. Not all of them, but if you look at the women who are really successful, 
if you look at the Jasmine stars, if you look at the, uh, I mean, even Dana Pugh, like she is like, okay, here I am. I'm, I'm fucking for real. Mm -hmm. See my awards that show it, see all these past clients and their happy testimonials, Mm -hmm. but she's not unsure of herself. Yeah. And that goes a long way. Mm -hmm. You look at the Jasmine stars, the the Tamara lackeys, the people who've hit it big Mm -hmm. and they never go, would that be okay? Right. Yeah. Like they own their shit. Mm -hmm. They show up, they're confident. And that's part of it is just being confident. Um, And then it's also, instead of being angry and pissy that they have to explain themselves, they just accept it as a fact and they do it in a very like calm, assertive way. Does that make sense? So, yeah. so what happens, I think often with women, and I know this because my wife, this is her go-to is mm-hmm. that she's like, wait, you're not listening to me. No, I'm fucking for real. And you're not listening to me. And now I'm angry, bitch, please. <laughs> like, let's go. <laughs> and like, it turns into like, I'm angry about it and pissed off mm-hmm. instead of like, no, I'm here. I'm calm. I'm assertive. I'll just prove you wrong. It's fine. Yeah, that makes sense. And I'm hearing like conversations with my husband in the background as you're speaking. <laughs> and I've even had him, even if like business aside, if there needs to be a phone call to the school or to the doctors or to a bill or whatever, I always am very quick to be like, Dave, you do it because it seems so easy for you people just respond to whatever you're asking for. Whereas me, it feels like I always end up in arguments with whoever's on the other end. Mm -hmm. And it's partially because men can stay in that calm, assertive place easier because they're just socialized too. And (laughs) they're socialized to, they're socialized to not really give a fuck. And men are also socialized to hear no and be like, yeah, but that's only the first no. So if, if you think about, how men are taught that women women like to play hard to get, mm-hmm. and so you have to be per, you have to just be persistent. Right. Like that's a thing men are men are taught, and men are not taught that a no makes them wrong, mm-hmm. or that a no means that it's a no forever. It's just that like oh, it's a no right now. I'll ask again later. Yeah. Or I'll just keep asking, or I'll explain to you why it shouldn't be a no. Like they're just men take no as like, Oh, okay. That's just the first no carry on. And women take a no as like, Oh God, no one wants me or loves me or cares about me. And I'm awful. And I should have never asked. And, uh, yeah. and Or they take it like, are you fucking kidding me? You shouldn't give me that. No, I'm pissed off. And it's not, it's, it's not a men. Uh, testosterone is a crazy thing. And biologically, I even have noticed having, like my hormone level is that of a man now Mm -hmm. and I have less shits to give. Like I just, I just don't give as many shits. It takes more for me to be pissed off and my rage is a productive rage versus a like sit and eat ice cream and cry about a rage and gossip and go out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like, it doesn't mean that that's the case. A, this is, these are sweeping generalizations. This is not how every woman reacts in business. And this is right. not how every man, man reacts in business. Mm-hmm. It's just culturally the way that we have been like indoctrinated. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? Yeah. It's, and so if women can like, when they're pissed off, if they can like take a deep breath, take their voice from being up here and angry and like a little bit squeaky and like that, you know, that quivery that you get when you're just about to cry and you're just like, Oh, mm-hmm. I'm so fucking angry right now. Mm-hmm. Why aren't you listening to me? Take a deep breath, drop your voice, speak slowly. Mm-hmm. Because when men get upset, they do not speak faster. Have you noticed that when your husband's pissed off, does mm-hmm. he start talking quicker? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. Nope. When you get pissed off, what happens? Oh, I just, he, had, he can't keep up. <laughs> right? Or you shut down completely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? That's typically women's response. I mean, look at the, look at the Gilmore Girls. Mm-hmm. Great fucking show. Do you know that their script is three times longer than the average script of any other show on TV? Get out of here. They sense, use but- three times more words in their script than any other show. Wow. And it's, a, it's partially because it's a female-dominated 
feminist show. Yeah. And they speak quickly and they like, and they're make, they're sort of like poking fun at the, like how quickly women's thoughts go. And I mean, it's also why women are awesome and can do more things than men. And it's why they can multitask and it's why mm -hmm. they can like take care of kids and run a business while their husbands are like, well, I worked seven hours today and it was really hard. I need to watch some TV. Like <laughs> once again, sleeping generalization, but like yeah. moms do everything. And husbands are like, going. Mm -hmm. oh, I put the dishes away. Do I get any extra favor because of that? <laughs> and like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, yeah. it's a, it's a biological difference as well. It's how we're cultured and it's biologically different. Yeah. And so your job is to sweep in and help us with your it factors and you help us amplify these things that make us unique. I had such an amazing experience with you. Can you uh, tell you. these guys what an it, it factor is and what it does for them? Yeah. So basically what it is, is it's that thing that people are hiring you for that you don't even know they're hiring you for. You think they're hiring you because you're a great photographer and you've got good branding and you're a really nice person. And the truth is, is that they're not hiring you for any of those reasons. They're hiring you because on some, there's some part of you that clicks with some part of them. Mm -hmm. And if you look at who all your favorite clients are, there will be a common thread. You'll notice that like, oh, if I really dissect it, I'm going to find what this common thread is. Mm -hmm. And it's because it's this type of person and I've made them feel this. So whatever it is that you are making your clients feel on your website, if that clicks with what they're looking to feel, they will book you. Mm -hmm. Which makes make total sense? sense because when I hit your website, I wasn't necessarily looking for any kind of validation or anything. But when I hit your site, the way that it spoke to me spoke to that need for this outside validation that I have. And when I had, just so you guys know, listening, when I had my call with Nick, that totally happened. And it was a couple weeks ago and I am still fired up. And I have, but not just like fired up inspired, but I have been, I feel like everything that I am doing now makes sense. I know 100% what my next steps are with confidence. And I don't know how to explain it. Like I feel like just more empowered that my story does matter, that I do have my own like unique voice, which is so interesting because similar to what you do, Nick, like that's in my course, Mastery Moment Seekers, that's a lot of what Mastery Moment Seekers is about is trying to show photographers how to bring out their story into their marketing plan. But I also go into systems and things like that. And it's really interesting how I can help other people do that, but I couldn't necessarily do that for myself. Uh, no one can do it for themselves. Yeah. I, I hire a coach because I can't do it for myself either. We mm -hmm. can't, you can't possibly see the, the thing that makes you so special to someone else because mm -hmm. you are not someone else. Right. Yeah. Right. Like you can't do it. You're too close. Mm -hmm. You can think that you can do it, but you just can't. It's just mm -hmm. like, it's just the way that it is. Um, and honestly, most people, the thing that makes them special is usually the thing that they're trying to hide the most because it's yeah. that thing that makes them different. And mm -hmm. the thing that makes you different is often seen as like, I don't want to be different. I want to, I want to be one of the cool kids. I want to fit in. I want to whatever. But guess what? It's those differences that make you one of the cool kids or that make you stand out, that make you special. So instead of running from them, embrace them. And the trick is, is embracing it with confidence instead of embracing it with like, oh, I'm afraid of this. Because if people like can hear your hesitation, mm -hmm. it doesn't feel good. If you think about like, okay, I am... Uh, I'm going to go buy a car, but like, there's something about the car salesperson mm -hmm. who feels like they're hesitant, like they're not sure of themselves. They're not sure of the car. Am I going to buy that car? No, because there's something that feels off and people, when they're getting ready to buy, if there's anything that feels off, if they have questions, if they're unsure, what happens is they go, Oh, this must be a sign from inside that like, no, this isn't the right thing. But the truth is, is that they just are unsure. Like it's just this little bit of insecurity over here in the corner 
that's poking out and like a thorn in their in their foot. They're like, oh, I, these shoes are uncomfortable. But it's just that there's a little tiny thorn stuck in the shoe and the rest of the shoe is fucking great. Mm-hmm. And it's stylish and it looks good and they want it. But like, they just have to take the thorn out. It's just that little, if you're feeling uncomfortable, if your hesitation and your questioning of your own self is coming through on your website, which if you have that, it probably is. Yeah. Um, people feel it and they know. And it's an instant block to purchasing. Totally. Man, there's so much to think about. Um, yeah, that makes so much sense to me. And I I say this a lot. I'm seeing now like all these same buzzwords. It was like documentary photography was this new and exciting thing. And that was the thing that makes these photographers in my community different. But now I'm seeing just all this same fluff. Like, let me tell your story. Let me preserve your memories and all the same thing. And they're still, they're holding them, their own selves back. So when you explain everything that you've explained, that makes total sense at why, like they're not. Yeah. Because they're... guess what? Everyone's saying that they want to tell your story. So yeah. what makes you more capable of telling the story than someone else? Mm-hmm. And it's not what makes you more capable of telling everyone's story. Everyone thinks that like, if I just keep myself as broad as possible, then I have a bigger pool to fish out of. Mm-hmm. The problem is, is that you will like, if you're like, yeah, I'm fishing with a, fly fishing lure in a pond, it's not going to work. You Mm -hmm. have to go take whatever tackle. Wow, this is a strange analogy. I'm doing a fishing analogy. (laughs) If if like, like, you know, when you were a kid and you like fish for rainbow fish and they like, there was the bob and the worm, but like you, if you were fishing for rainbow fish, that's the right way to catch them. Mm -hmm. If you are looking for a salmon, you're not going to catch shit with your bob and your worm because the salmon doesn't want that. They need tackle and like a special kind that wiggles and it has to be a little bit shiny, but not too shiny. And Mm -hmm. it has to move just like this. So for you as, as people out there trying to sell things, what specific, if you're trying to catch all the fish with just a fucking worm, Mm -hmm. it's probably not going to work, especially in the ocean. But if you're like, I want to catch the rainbow fish with the worm in a small lake with the little Bobby thing, then you're likely to do that. If mm-hmm. you're looking to catch a swordfish, then you need to go to the ocean for that and you need a specific type of tackle. Figure out who your client is. Figure out who you are. Figure out what they're looking for. What are they looking to feel? What is your why for why you're doing it? And how do those things line up? Mm-hmm. Just having casting a bigger net is not the right answer. It's how do I cast the right net? for the right people. Yeah. Yeah. And it goes along with when they're casting that bigger net, they're working harder too. They're sharing Mm -hmm. more content. Mm -hmm. They're burning more calories of brain power energy. (laughs) The only people who get to cast a really big net in a really big ocean are people that are doing it for really cheap. Yeah. And they're full. And that's totally fine. Also, if your philosophy is I just want to shoot a fuck ton Mm -hmm. at a low price and offer a little bit less quality of a product. That's it. Everybody needs photos and everybody has a different budget level. I don't think there's anything wrong with shoot and burn photographers. Mm -hmm. It just depends on, is that who you want to be or is it not? Because there's the people who hire a shoot and burn photographer are not looking for the same experience that you might offer. If you don't want to be a shoot and burn photographer, Mm -hmm. people hate on shoot and burns. And I feel like don't hate just because they want to do a lot more photos and put a little less work into it and do it for less money. That's a perfectly fine option. Mm -hmm. Just isn't your option. So don't try and sell yourself the same way as shoot and burn photographers are selling themselves. You're in a different market. You're talking to different people. Yeah. Yeah. And this is so necessary when you're marketing online. It's a different ball game when you're talking to people in person. And what I see happening is people are relying on marketing themselves online and then they're not making their website work for themselves and they're, they're mm-hmm. casting their net out too wide. They're, they don't have a clear plan and a clear strategy. Yeah. And I think this is a good time for me to tell you guys that if you are really unsure of like what to say when you're showing up on social media or you're wondering like, well, what am I missing? What's, what am I not doing? Because you can't see it. You're blind to it. 
Nick is definitely the go-to guy for that. I will be linking in the show notes so you can actually directly jump to his It Factor sessions. You can see it and or you can go directly to his website, which is, is it epicdanger.com? Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. Keep it, it's keeping it simple. Yeah. I love that. So we're going to switch gears a little bit because I want to bring some more of the, the creative photography side back into the mix. And Nick, as you know, from working with me, I have this big passion around pictures serving a, the purpose of being the, like the memory collector for your family. Mm. As cheesy as that sounds, it really does something for me. So how are you and your family managing your memories? And guys, mm. the man has five kids. It's so. true. We do have five kids. So there's a lot of memories. Uh, we actually talked about it, all, my wife and I, about like how we're not doing a good enough job of this. Mm. We take a lot of images. We use our phones a crap ton. We Instagram a lot. Um, I will often use one of those services that like I'll make a, it'll make a photo book out of your Instagram account because Mm -hmm. I feel like that's a really, I Instagram a ton and I don't wait until like, it's the perfect photo that matches the perfect tile selection on my, I just like Instagram what I have and what I see. And so throughout a year, it's really easy to go through and sit down one night and just like print into a photo book, a bunch of, um, a bunch of images and like, look, it's a cute little book and it's done. But also we hire someone every year to do our family photos. Um, this last year we were lucky enough to have both Tara Whitney and Dana Pugh do photos for us, Mm -hmm. which was super friggin' awesome. Um, and we've had Jen Downer, my wife and I had Jen Downer do photos for us. we We hire people to do our photos because often I find that photographers do this thing where um, I'm a photographer. So it is a waste of my money to hire someone else. Mm -hmm. Cause, and they're like spouses are like, but wait, you have a $7,000 camera kit. Why can't we take the photos? It doesn't work the same. Just like you can see a family differently than they can see themselves. It doesn't, it's the same that way. So there's that. Also, now that our older kids are a little bit older, they're like really hungry. They're like, they do that thing. They're like, show me a picture when I was this age. So we decided this year for Christmas, we're going to create a photo book for each of them from like oh, cool. when they were younger and like a good quality, like leather bound photo book. And that's going to be one of their big Christmas gifts. That's like, this, this is your memory book just for you. Um, and we do albums for ourselves as well. Okay. Very cool. I was just going to ask about your kids because I know when my dad's parents passed away, there was this big box of photos and they had five boys, but there was only one box of photos. So I was wondering if you were doing something for each kid. So I, I, that's. Yeah, that's our our big plan. It's it's the Christmas gift is they're all going to get a book of like, probably three to five years of their lives where it's like, so some of them will have the same photos cause it'll be a family photo in it or mm-hmm. whatever, but to like get them started that they have their own books. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. We are going to talk about Nick's iconic photo that he submitted. If you are listening, you could pause me or you could just do this later. Depends on what you want to do, but you can go to fearless and forward slash intentional documentary podcast and navigate to the show notes for this episode so that you can follow along and actually see the photo that we're about to talk about. So I'm looking at this gorgeous photo and there are four people in it. There's big sister, mom and dad, and a new baby. They're all on the couch. Big sister is doing her own thing, watching TV. She is watching TV. Yep. Yeah. There's toys in the foreground and all around really great framing on this. I might add. Um, thank you. And what I noticed right away that stood out to me is mom's looking down at the new baby and dad is looking at mom and you can tell that this is such, it's an organic moment. It wasn't just, this doesn't look coached whatsoever. (laughs) Yeah. It was one of those times where, um, so these clients of mine, I think that because I photographed them so many times, I got, I get to have a 
more realistic look in their lives because they're they're pretty comfortable with me. I have I did their engagement photos, their wedding photos, their newborn for their first kid, their maternity photos for their first kid, mm-hmm. um, and then their newborn photos now for their second kid. So I have like I have photographed the crap out of them. They're really comfortable with me, and they are your classic like parents of one kid quickly gone to two like. Oh God, now we have another kid. And our first kid is like sort of being a dictator because she's like, what the hell? Your life used to revolve around me and now it's not. And I'm a little bit, uh, and so like, I love that Maeve is fully like leaning right up against mom with like her arm on her shoulder. And she's like, I'm still owning you. I can tell you're distracted, but it's fine. I'll distract myself also with this television. Mm -hmm. And the way Scott is looking at his wife is just like, it's the exact same way he looked at her like five years earlier and their engagement photos when he was just like still, you know, when couples are like so in love that they're like a little bit stammery over each other. And mm-hmm. like, he looks at her the exact same way. And it's just one of my favorite, like their house is a mess. There there's toys everywhere because they're like, well, the three-year-old gets whatever she wants at this point because we don't have time to argue with her about it. And Maeve wanted nothing to do with the photos because they were, they weren't about her. They were about her sister. And it was just this like, well, I guess we're going to let you watch super amounts of television and play with all the toys everywhere. And this is just life. And it's the like chaos of a new baby and the like exhaustion and the love. And like, cause I remember bringing home new babies and remembering like, how much love you're just like overwhelmed with, but also like the intense chaos around you as well. It's like all the overwhelm and all the good, bad, and in different ways, you know? Mm -hmm. And so this photo captures that like first few days of a newborn so perfectly to me. For sure. I was just going to ask what, when this was, was it just within the first few days or of coming home or? I think this is day five. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great work. Thank thank you you for this. I hope that all of you listening learned so much. Nick, will you tell everyone where they can find you? Yeah. You can stalk me on Instagram at Epic Danger. That is probably where I show up the most. If you want to see my kids more than you'd like, you can (laughs) find me there. Uh, You can find me at epicdanger.com for work stuff. And you can find me at theverybestman.com for blogging. Yeah. Well, thank you. And you guys, like I said, you can go to fearlessandframed.com forward slash intentional documentary podcast. You can see that picture that we were just talking about. Um, Navigate to the show notes. And thanks for being here, Nick. Thanks for having me. Thank you to our podcast team for making the Intentional Documentary podcast possible. Our sound editor, Lucy Burgess, Mini Mag designer, Jillian Adriana, and our show notes manager, Ebony Rivera. Special thank you to our episode guests for openly sharing their insight. And thank you for listening, of course. Please hit the review tab to leave a rating. I'd love to read about your favorite episodes and what has really clicked for you. And remember, the only way to approach your photography is through your lens, your way photograph freely and I'll see you next time. Visit fearlessandframed.com forward slash intentional documentary podcast for this episode and all past episodes, show notes, and mini mags.